receiver and installation. All right? So what I'm telling you here now is the person taking the delivery should examine the valve for any sign of shipping damage. Right? So once you is the person on the site on the job site collecting the valve, part of your job is to inspect for any damage. And that is only sensible in terms of receiving any package. Right? So the tell you what to look for. Step two, they say the packing slip should be checked and verified. Right? So what you do when you're really checking the name, getting some feedback. Yes, yeah, so somebody I'm video come on there. Right? So what you'll be really doing, you're checking the name of the valve, you're checking the pressure rating. The valve should have an ID number to it, right? You're checking all that to make sure that and verify that is the correct valve that you receive. Step three, you check that the valve cap and end protection are in place on the valve. Valve must come with end cap, right? You're not collecting no valve and, and, and the end cap removed or, or piece bust out. Because what will happen, small particles that go and stick up inside the valve. The valve does come with a special grease, right? And when that stick up, the, 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 this, the closing mechanism just gives trouble to close after a while. So you have to check and you have to make sure that, hey, that the end caps are there, right? Our next advice is if it's a gate, a glove valve, once that valve is on, you should turn the handle too to make sure it's moving freely. Right. Step four. See, if it is a flange valve, make sure that the face of the flange are free from nicks or scratch. If it's a screwing end valve, also you have to make sure that the tread is not damaged, right? So you watch the flange face and make sure that it's free from nicks. Because sometimes they could just take a valve and just slap on an end protection and bring it for you, right? Some of these end protection just cover the whole face of the valve, right? So the raised face will go down and meet with the face of the plant. Sometimes all that cover. So we have to know and inspect it. They have to uncover it and watch it. Make sure it's in good order. Because if the plant should be damaged and you receive that, what go up You have to call one of you have to hire one of these company one of reface plants. To come and reface that plan. They come like you're spending bad money. So you make sure that it's in good um, operating condition when you're receiving it. Last thing to tell you to do here now, record the model number and serial number for future reference. Why? Sometime after these valves are in use for a number of years. If you don't have the model number or the serial number, right? The valve tag does, does eventually fade away, right? So when you take that record now, that's so in case anything should happen to that valve, you know what number, the, the, the serial number of the valve, you know what parts number associated with that, right? Because it does fade away, right? Initial insulation of a valve. So we are about to install the valve here in the service. So I tell you, when you're installing the valve in the service, remove the end protection and examine the pipe ends for physical damage. So you remove the end protection on your valve. If you have that end protection on the pipe also, remove it. You examine the pipe end, meaning you examine the end the valve is going to be connected to to make sure it is in good working order. You don't want to take your new valve and, and you bolt it up to an old flange and then after you realize, boy, you're supposed to machine that flange before we put on that valve because it's leaking, right? So number two, they say verify the valve identification with the drawing. The valve will have a number, right? Two inch, 150, so, so, so a number associated with that valve. 
right? That number will be on the join also, the isometric join, right? So you just verify that is a two inch. If it's a two inch, and let me say a glove valve, so you make sure it's a two inch glove valve you have. Make sure it mark on the valve body. Make sure the number which is on the valve is the same number you are seen on the join. Right? So you just want to verify that these things are there. Number three say you ensure that the pipe support are in place and the pipe and the valve are parallel. Why do you think you have to make sure the pipe support are in place? Hmm? Anybody? You're making sure the pipe support are in place. Anybody know why? When you put the valve on the connected to the line, it wouldn't put on no extra strain. Yeah, yeah. So you wouldn't put no additional strain onto the piping system. And sometimes too, sometimes our valve going and hook up to a pump. Now, if that valve going and hook up to a pump, you don't want to set a strain on the pump, you know, because the pump makes us a cast iron. Any strain on the pump does eventually crack the cast iron. So you have to make sure the supports and things in place, right? If the valve, sometimes the valve don't have no support, but the support is onto the flange and pipe assembly, you're going to hook up the valve too, right? If you're installing the valve first, you have to block the valve. So you put wood and stuff under the valve and make a good sturdy blockage on the valve. Make sure the valve plumb block it up good. So you don't put no strain on the pump or the next side of the piping. Right? Number four. You check pipe for corrosion or debris. Blow out or flush out prior to installing the valve. So the piping, you're going out and install these valves too. You have to make sure that it doesn't have no stuff in it. As we just say, we local term, it has stuff in the line. Right? So you make sure it doesn't have no debris. If it has debris, you blow it out or you flush it out before you install the valve. Number five, remove the stop or packing from the valve body. Right? Some valves have stops. Right? Some valves have a packing. Some of them have a grease. Right? So make sure you take um, a degreaser. Right? The company go have appropriate degree degreasers. Most of the time we just use CRC. CRC have a degreaser. You spray it and you wipe off the grease within the valve. Right? You pack in grease to put inside the valve. Um, number six, you install the valve in the designated location. Verify with the join, the location and orientation. Now, when they're talking about the location and the orientation, they mean the orientation, um, like the direction of the oh, valve, no, no, the direction no, no, no. of flow. Remember, the, check like valve pose, yes, no. look like I'm, yes. and groove valves. Some gate valves will have directional arrow on them. So you make sure that you, you catch the direction of the flow from the join and you hook up the valve appropriately. Right? Orientation also does go with the valve handle. Some valve handles don't go at 90 degrees, they go at 45 degrees, they go at an angle, right? So you have to make sure that you put it in the position that the joint is calling for, right? Most of the time the joint call for it in that position is either to avoid something, running into something, or for ease of operation, right? Number seven, you follow the manufacturer specification for mounting the actuator, right? So if you put in a valve with an actuator, the manufacturer has a certain specification how to mount it. And I guess when we look at the practical, I'll, I'll, I'll get some of the diagrams, right? To show you. And when I mean how you're mounting it, how you're actually tying the straps for the crane, or for whatever lifting it, if you're using a, um, one of these overhead arms with the mechanical, um, like a mechanical crane, 
Or you use a crane, the manufacturer will show you how you're supposed to tie off the valve. Right? Um, we was working a shutdown in Atlantic. Now, normally when we work in construction and we install in valve, right? You know, in fresh construction, we don't have no, we don't really have no guideline how we tie the valve and have this accurator. So, you know, you go on memory. You are custom, you are custom tying it so for it doesn't damage the accurator. So, uh, the valve there, um, the riggers there. Well, a uh, fabricator on a construction side will be like the lead person. Beside the foreman, if the foreman in there, the fabricator in charge. So, everybody, the valve reach and I say so all the way to know like all in all the time, pass the sling here and I must say no one why can't all you work in the long time you start to teach so you forget how this thing going. I say how it going. They say no Atlantic don't want that Atlantic have a procedure for every valve. How that how you should tie the valve. Whether the valve have an accurator, right? Only small valve, right? And remember small valve is under two inch. Right? So let me say, only valve what they know you can't manually handle. Right? They would not have a, the valve, they would not have a direction, a, a direct procedure how to tie off that valve. But once that valve, what crane has a look is have a procedure how to tie off the valve. What size sling to use? Right? The, the size meaning the width and the length of the sling. And you have to get that sling. Right? So you have a procedure. We had to wait for them to set up a book. And when, you, when the book reach, you check your valve number. Right? You look in the book, you find that number associated with that valve. And it have a diagram showing you how to pass this link to balance that valve. Once you follow that diagram and that crane pick up that valve, you can rest a level on that valve. That valve balance. Right? Because they have procedure for you to follow. Right? And some of the valve companies, some of the manufacturers have the same specification and procedure how to lift the valve when the valve have an actuator, how to lift it and mount it in place. So, step number eight say, you follow the standard principle for tightening connection. Right? We know the principle where we tighten the connection. Right? You make up, you make sure it, it parallel to each other, it's in line, right? Sometimes you use, well, we just call it rat tail spanner, right? Your rat tail or you use a bull pin to make sure your bolt hole and them line up. You run your bolts, um, you connect your bolts hand tight, right? And that's your connecting procedure. But then they tell you now, Flange bolting should be torque using crossover pattern. So one year running it up, right? It's have a procedure, right? And I like to draw Atlantic because I feel in all the plants, Atlantic are the most procedure. Now you as a fitter, you're not tightening Nova. They have teams and they have other companies coming and tighten up the valve. What you do is, what the procedure is, you run up the bolt, hand tight, you just probably put the spanner and you pull four bolts. You pull it so that when you take the weight of the valve, it will drop down. But you're not tightening off that valve. They're bringing a torque machine and they're putting on each nut to know hey, how much pressure you're putting to tighten that nut. Because um, I had some strong man partners in the past. It has some aluminum flange. The bust the flange. Because the tightening it too much. Right? So Atlantic said, but we don't want to happen. But when you bust the aluminum flange, you have to change the flange, you have to stay away from our flange. You delay the shutter. So with that now, your hand tighten, you pull four bolts, pull a little, make sure it didn't drop, and you leave it for the torque company 
and them to come in and tighten up the valve. That is the procedure. When they tighten in the valve, they use the crossover pattern, so it's like this opposite. Make sure to pull. Right? Valve used in hot work application must be insulated in accordance to the manufacturer specification. Right? It must be installed in accordance with the manufacturer specification. Right? So any valve you're hooking up. The manufacturer will have certain guidelines for you to use when you're installing the valve so that you wouldn't damage the valve. You should, as much as possible, stick to the manufacturer instruction or follow the standard principle that the plant, that the company will be using, right? But as much as possible, the company just try to stick with the manufacturer specification. So we're looking now at the gate valve. Gate, and they're telling you how these valves here you now could be connected, how they could be mounted. Right? So they tell you gate valves can be mounted for flow in either direction. So you can mount up this valve. You ain't got to really pay much attention which side is the pressure side. But I, for some model, they say care should be taken when installing the knife gate valve because some model has specific inlet and outlet design. These models have a flow arrow cast onto the body, right? So some model, and that is the knife gate valve, will have a pressure side, right? A certain side to mount. You see that way, that is how the flow going. You have to mount that side. So that way it will have an arrow cast onto the body. The arrow will show you the direction of flow. Meaning that side is the pressure side of the gate valve, right? Gate valve are recommended to be installed with a valve stem set in the vertical up position. One simple solution for obtaining valve clearance is to rotate the valve on the bolt hole. What it means to rotate the valve on the bolt hole now, right? Remember I tell you certain times, you will rotate the valve, say this valve was going at a 90 degree, and you realize that it didn't have enough clearance on top, or it's too close to the top pipe when the installation wants. Sometimes engineers just miss to it, right? So when they had the pipe running to the top, and it had the clearance all the time, but that pipe kind something hot or something cold, you had to put insulation around the pipe so that somebody wouldn't get burned. Because hot will burn you, cold will also burn you. Right? So they'll put insulation on the pipe. Sometimes the insulation one four inches thick. Then you put on the insulation, that clearance where the valve on the hand, you can really function to open that valve or close that valve with it. So what you will come and do in this case, you will rotate the valve. And you're rotating it on the bolt hole. Provided a plan the valve, you rotate the valve on the bolt hole. Meaning that you roll it two hole, you roll it three hole down, depending to put the angle at a 45 degree, right? If it's a valve with four hole, you're just rolling it one hole down to get a valve going at a 45 degree, right? So you roll, you roll your valve to suit. Any question based on the Valve stem orientation and rolling out. Everybody understand? Feedback? Anybody everybody understand? Okay. 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 I hear that person say well, I'll take that as I hear. So um no Mr. Cado, the um rolling and the yeah. valve is the um the, the amount of turns then? The... No. That just saying the bolt hole itself. Oh, the bolt remember, hole. I, remember, normally, flange or straddle, you say two hole center, right? Right, right. Two right. hole center. But if you realize the valve running into that object, you, you roll up that valve and you put the valve like one hole center. We will cause the hand wheel now to go at an angle. You can keep it there? 
So you're lining up the 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 um, um the valve on the flange one whole center. So that will roll the flange, that will roll the hand wheel off. So you go set it at a 45 degree. Right. Oh, no. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Sometimes you might have to roll, depending on the number of holes, you might have to roll two or three holes off center. Sometimes they tell you to roll the valve at a 60 degree or a 30 degree. Right? In this case, when you're rolling it, what will happen here? I have a protractor to set it. And I will, right? and I will, I will you have to send the valve to suit. To suit. You, are, you are just the valve to suit. Right? right. You are just right. the valve to suit. But once the valve are planned and you could just roll it off the suit, you just un unbolt it and you just roll the, the, the valve off the suit. Okay. Right? You make sure it doesn't run into no obstacle. You make sure it's easy to open and close. All right. Understood. All right. Pull it in a row, in a row, in a row it. So yeah, you're adjusting it to suit to prevent obstruction. obstruction. Yeah, to prevent obstruction. All right. That's right, 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 right. them off. To prevent obstruction. Yeah. Yeah. Right? All right. All right. So we're going again. We're talking about the ball, the butterfly, and the plug valve here now. See? These are all full flow valves, meaning that you could see straight through these valves, more or less. Right? It didn't have no step up and step down like all the globe valve and that. It more or less is seen through like how you see through the gate valve. They are often used in place of gate valve. Right? Installation of these valves follow the general rule. Valves are placed in the vertical position. So same rule. You're placing the valve in the vertical position, the handle going vertically. They say for the butterfly and ball with particulate matter, if it are particles in the fluid now, the manufacturer recommend installing or installation of the valve with the stem horizontal. Right? So if it have particles within the valve, within the um, liquid, the manufacturer recommend that once it is is you're transporting something in particles, put the valve handle in a horizontal position. So you're moving the valve handle from the top position and you're rotating it to a horizontal position. You're, making, you're moving it from the 90 and you're rotating it like a 90 degree straight across. Right? So from 180, let me say 180, and you rotate it to a 90 degree. Right? So you're moving it from the vertical to the horizontal position. The seat retaining ring used on some butterfly and an entry ball valve configuration let the valve be installed with a seat retaining ring on the downstream side of the valve the valve some butterfly right at some ball valve configuration they have a seat retaining ring some manufacturer recommend right you have to go with the manufacturer recommendation eh? that you put the you put the um, seat retainer on the downstream side of the valve, right? The downstream side, meaning not the pressure side. You're putting it on the opposite side, right? The pressure side is what is upstream, right? Downstream is anything that's going out of the valve, right? Upstream will be before the valve, right? Last point. As with gate valves, the manufacturer instruction for these valves require that these valves be operated through a complete cycle after the line is installed. Meaning that once everything complete off, right, you run, if, even though you run um, through a full cycle, if you cycle it with just water or you cycle it just with air to clear the line, but you run it through a full cycle. Some valves you cannot cycle with water depending on way connected right because if you look at these air operated valves you don't use normal it have plant air it have plant it have plant air and it have instrument air the difference with plant air and instrument air now the instrument air does be a drier air so you know you're gonna take um 
filters, right? A compressor go have filters to take out the moisture from the air because it's pulling regular air and it running through the equipment. But for plant air, a plant air equipment have less filter than if that like instrument air. Instrument air, you're trying to take out as much moisture as possible. So it wouldn't corrode the inside of the instrument, right? Some of these instruments, the pack could get corroded. You know what that? The moisture from the air could corrode it. So you will find that instrument air does be a drier air, right? You think you have no set of moisture in that air, right? You take out as much moisture as possible, right? But you follow the manufacturer instruction when you're cycling through the valve. So if you know you had to cycle through with water or with air or with steam, you cycle through before you start to really operate the valve. You make sure you run through something to cycle it before you start the valve in full operation. Globe valve. The globe valve is generally mounted with a stem in the vertical position. The inlet flow helps to push the valve this up from the seat. Remember the video we are showing, we are seeing earlier. For those who saw the video, you saw when they show the, the globe valve and the liquid coming. The liquid helping that when you're opening it now, that liquid kind of helping to push up the disc from off the seat. Right? The valve stem control the rate at which this move up from the valve seat. The valve body have an arrow to indicate the flow direction. Stem orientation may also be possible, but the, but the manufacturer supposed to be instruction should be the manufacturer should be consulted before you make any stem orientation. Stem orientation just means you're rolling the valve. Right? You're changing the direction normally in the horizontal position. But in case something should, uh, normally in the vertical position, but in case something should be um, causing an obstacle, you have to roll that valve. You have to check the manufacturer for them and consult the manufacturer for them to say, well, yes, it's all right to roll the valve, or that will cause so much whatever um, trouble with the valve. So, you know, you have to get a different group valve which you could which could function in that capacity. Right. Check valve. Old rule of thumb. Swing check valve were to be used with gate valve and lift check. Right? So swing check using with gate valve and lift check. Right? And no. Swing check using with gate valve and the lift check using with the globe valve. Right? That is because of the design. A swing check can have no set of obstacles like the speed bumps, right, going through it. It's a kind of open flow. But the lift check designed just like the globe valve inside. So you use both of them together. When selecting a check valve, select the check valve best suited for the job. Check valve are mounted with a flow arrow pointing in the direction of the system flow. The flow arrow must be in the direction as the system flow, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Check valve is for one-way flow, okay? Swing check should be mounted with the pivot pointed, with the pivot point of the disc running horizontally across the top of the disc, right? The pivot point, and if you look, it have a pin to the outside. That does normally run horizontal with the cross section of the disc, across the top of the disc, and the lift check valve are designed for service in horizontal plane. Lift check disc may be in the form of either a piston or a ball. So, you have a piston type or a ball type lift check disc for the um, check valve. The ball is just a circular ball where it move off the seat, right? So they're telling you, ball check valves are more common in viscous fluid flow, right? Anything like oil and those stuff, you're more used to ball, right? 
Livecheck are chosen for service where extra pressure where extra pressure loss due to the flow pattern is not a factor because of the design of the lift check it will have a pressure drop so once you know that will cause no harm pa, no damage it will slow down the flow too drastically you could use the lift check in this case the engineer will determine what type of check valve to use check valve variation so you talk about the vertical lift check available in this and ball configuration using either hard or soft seat. And this may be used in a horizontal line, but the disc have a spring assisted closure. Right? So double check valve will consider guided this. But what happened with this now? Anytime it had a close. A spring assisting it in closing. So the liquid go move the disc from off the seat, but the spring, once the liquid stops, the spring pulling it back to seal it off good. You have a tilted disc check. Right? Till the disc check are mounted to swing. Till the disc check operate at low velocity, but are expensive to purchase. Right? So you ain't need much pressure to operate this check valve. Low velocity, low slow flow, and it will still work because of how, how we design it, tilted. Right? But the only problem with it is it's a little expensive. Right? Yeah. The folded this check are used in low pressure liquid and gas service. The folded this check are spring loaded and are manufactured in the wafer body pattern, right? Then you have the stop check valve, right? Stop check valve are used in vaporizing service such as steam boilers, right? So you use it with vapor, steam boilers more or less. Stop check valve are used to combine the function of a stop valve and check valve where code requires the installation of both valves in a discharge line. Now, they make reference to a boiler because boiler is certain code, right? Boiler is certain instrument on a boiler you cannot leave out because it wouldn't, um, the association wouldn't pass it. It wouldn't certify that boiler safe to use. So what I'm saying, a boiler must have a stop valve and a check valve mounted. Remember, we talk about the stop, the stop, um, the stop check valve is something like the globe and a check valve in one, right? So they tell you, that, hey, you must have that on the boiler system. It will take the place of the stop valve, which is more or less like a globe. Instead of you putting two valves, then you could use this one valve, but performing more or less the two functions on the boiler discharge. Guys, diaphragm valve. The diaphragm and the pin valve operation are similar and both depend on external force to collapse and squeeze the outside wall to close flow. So smooth, remember your question yesterday when you talk about the similarities of the diaphragm and the pin valve and I tell you both of them have the closing mechanism squeezing the elastoma rubber. So here the place, yeah, yeah. you ain't reading through your slides at all. Here the place in yes, proper context. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the telling you, yeah, I just didn't understand it. All right. So I will run back and I will show the video. Right? So we go see the operation. So the telling you, the diaphragm and the pin valve operation are similar because both depend on a diaphragm valve. Remember I tell you when you screw down the handle, the force pushing the rubber downwards and squeezing it against the, the seed end, right? Or the wear. And it's stopping the flow. But with the pinch valve now, you're gonna realize when you want to 
turning it in the off position. It have a rod to the side. Just pull up the two, well, it come like two seats or two metal that come and pinch or squeeze the elastoma rubber to stop the flow, right? So it's a little two feet here that make the diaphragm desirable. Uh, the diaphragm can be changed without removing the valve from the line. It's easy to service. Remember the diaphragm is this rubber we mounted on top of the valve. Eh? So all you have to do is more or less unbolt and remove that rubber and replace it with a new rubber. So it's really easy. You ain't have to take it out of uh, uh, the line to, re to, to replace it or to service it. And I tell you, the bonnet of the valve is isolated from the fluid process. So there are no, me no way that top work of the valve get in contact with the fluid because it's rubber sealing it all, right? Um, and we'll just, well, that's about it for the presentation tonight. But before I take any questions, let me just go back to the video on the diaphragm valve. On the pinch valve. Right. All right, the volume one. So what I want you to do is pay attention and listen. Pay attention to how it close, how the closing mechanism working, right? In the pinch valve. A pinch valve offers a cost-effective and practical solution for controlling the flow of media through a pipeline or any other system. The operating principle of pinch valves is simple. In the open position, the valve is full bore with no flow restrictions. During closing, two pinch bars squeeze the valve sleeve shut on the center line. The sleeve is naturally wear resistant and when particles hit the sleeve's rubber surface, the energy is absorbed and released when the rubber bounces back. Pinch valves are controlled through linear motion via manual screw mechanism, or linear pneumatic or electric actuator. Heavy-duty pinch valves provide bubble-tight shutoff, even if solids have built up on the sleeve wall. When compressed, any crystallized particles flake off the sleeve surface. The full-bore structure ensures free flow of the medium. The construction and materials of the three main components, sleeve, body and actuator, can be tailored to suit your process conditions. Pinch valves have gained increased popularity in a wide variety of industries such as wastewater treatment, cements, mining, food and beverage, medical, pharmaceuticals, others, primarily because they offer tight shutoff, full pore flow, and pressurized self-cleaning from the movement of the flowing media. Benefits of pinch valves Long service intervals Only one are excellent for slurries, dry powders, and abrasive materials and low maintenance cost. Right, so I hope you see the operation because it's really our, our, our external mechanism operating on one rod, coming and pinch these two bars together and the seat or the pinch itself squeezing the rubber and shutting off the valve, right? It's similar to the diaphragm valve, right? That's why most of them class them under the diaphragm valve because of that rubber which just come in and squeeze down the shut off flow. Right? Any questions? Any questions at all? Wanna hear me? Yeah, 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 no, I, I, I have no questions. So I uh, uh, understand everything that yeah. was taught tonight. Right? Yeah. Um, Mr. Kadol. Um, Mr. Kadol. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is Andreas. <laughs> uh, um, uh, um, uh, I would just uh, like to know um, where was the, the topic uh, for the start of the year. 
Mitte te sinne. Mitte. Slide, slide. Slide. Tada, di slide. Yeah, was was the topic. Yeah, was the topic. Right. I I I hear you partially. But you get real feedback. But we're going on with the, with the start of the second part after the break. This is what we that, that, this is what we cover in the second part. Uh, no, right? in, in the first know. part. In, in the first part. Eh? The, the first part. The first part. All right. Shut up your mic there. All right. Take off your mic. All right. All right. Right. So people, Ooh. you ask um, what was covered. You see, objective one here, right? Identifying common material problem and service and, and maintenance procedure for the valve. That was covered more or less in the first part. We're going to talk about the bonnet, the different type of bonnet, the, the screw, the union, and the bolted, right? That was talking about. This more or less common, they identify common maintenance problem. They talk about the bonnet might give some problem, and they talk about um, to prevent leaking, you tighten down on the packing, you tighten down on the packing nut. That was covered in the first part. The second part, you know, describe um, procedure and common service problem. This procedure they're talking about is when you're collecting the valve. If you look at this, this dealt more on the valve reaching to the side and the collection, the installing of the valve, right? And some of the problems that you might encounter in terms of the valve end damage, in terms of the line might be dirty, right? In terms of you're supposed to inspect the valve before receiving it. They also tell you that you're supposed to record the, the, the valve number. So in future reference, in case it should, you should run into a problem where the tag that you could go back and, and say, well, valve number, so, 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 in area, whatever, this is the specification for it, because you recorded it, right? Um, answer your question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. So, Part of the installation of the valve was telling you the direction of the valve handle. And in most cases, the one the valve handle in the vertical position, right? In the vertical position. It also tell you about good practice when you're installing the ball valve, right? So the gate valve, you want the valve in the vertical position, the gate and the globe. Because you don't want, when you turn it upside down, if you just put the handle upside down, what it tell you, Within the bonnet here, right? If it had any particles flowing through the line, it will settle in the bonnet and it will start to cause a problem when you're opening and closing the, the disc, right? So they tell you the center of the valve, the, um, the bonnet must be above the center of the piping, right? The bonnet above the center of the piping. Bonnet above the center of the piping here. And if you look at the center, the see this pipe in here, this bonnet is still above him. Right? So, there are really the chance of particles going and settle within the bonnet. Right? They tell you the different bonnet connections, screwing, um, screw the union, the bolted. They give you criteria when you're using them. They say the bolted is for um, more industrial or I should add high pressure work. And the screw in is more for like to the union bonnet is one that requires if, if you feel the valve might require frequent servicing, you use the union bonnet. Right? They give you the difference with the smaller valves. Right? The screw in and the union bonnet will have the packing nut to the top here. So in case liquid should seep through the stem, you could tighten down on your packing nut, right? But you know after a while, your packing will become too compressed and you'll have to change the valve packing itself. It mentioned the stem, right? The type of stem, 
mention that the global and the world valve, the stem, even though we have four mechanisms, they still consider um, rise and non-rise, right? So even though we have four different mechanisms for these several different variation for the um, me mechanism design for the stem, the stem really come down to rising stem and non-rising stem. Because, back to the picture, even though we say the stem coming through the valve handle, it's still the stem rising. And uh, even though the valve handle and the stem rising, it's still the rising, right? The non-rising stem now, what will happen with the non-rising stem? The this will slide up and down the stem and the handle and the stem itself, you wouldn't see no change in that. It's just the disc going up and down the stem, right? The handle have no change in the handle. So it's a non-rising stem, right? It's only the disc will move uh, The fourth category we mentioned yesterday was the sliding rod, right? The sliding stem. Right? But what happened with that is either it, it rise or it's a non rising it. Right? The stem itself will be, you mightn't see it, some of you mightn't see the stem sliding, but inside, right? And let me just play this video quick. Let me just play the video so that you can see the sliding stem. Right, in operation with the control valve, and it's, it's a stem where you will use on control valve. The actuator is the power operated device that allows us to move the valve and modulate fluid flow rate. As you can see here, actuators come in a variety of shapes and sizes to meet the needs of different valve applications. Upper and lower diaphragm casings house the internal components of the actuator and create pressure chambers that a pneumatic control signal can be applied to. The upper diaphragm casing is removed to access the internal components. The diaphragm is a flexible pressure responsive element that the pneumatic control signal is applied to. The diaphragm plate is a rigid plate that the diaphragm pushes against as pressure is increased. The actuator stem is connected directly to the diaphragm plate. A coupling block is typically used to couple the actuator stem and the valve stem. The final component in this actuator is the spring, which provides an opposing force to the diaphragm and will also provide an inherent fail mode. The actuator here on the right is a direct acting actuator, which has the loading connection on the top of the diaphragm casing. The actuator on the left is reverse acting, which has the loading connection below the diaphragm casing. As we increase the pressure, the direct acting actuator on the right extends toward the valve assembly. The reverse acting actuator on the left retracts away from the valve assembly. Now, if the pressure is decreased or lost, the spring will move the actuator stem in the opposite direction, away from the valve body. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the classroom. Right, so I, I hope the video explained better, and then you have a visual on it, how the sliding stem works. So still, no sliding stem. Um, right. The mention also, we also mentioned the disc replacement and the disc replacement and that uh, um, anything right? Right? Key thing when you're changing your isolator, like with everything you isolate, you lock out your toggle, right? Um, you say you must, um, when you're changing it, always put it in the fully open position, right? 
Next step, you loosen your bonnet knot because you're ready. You're ready. You want to re remove the bonnet and the stem assembly, right? You remove this, you replace it this, and you reassemble. Right? So that. Apple Mola. When they collect the bag, right? So you examine the bag. You check out the bag. Cap is protect. The end protection is on. You check that you make sure the flange is damaged, and you record the model number, serial number, right? For future reference. Right? Yeah, they're talking about. The initial installation of the valve. So, I'll come back here, here. You're installing the valve here now. So, you remove the end, you re verify the identification on the joint. So, you make sure. Now, I would have put number two first. Eh? You make sure eh, you, uh, you, ver the, you verify the valve identity on the joint. The protection, and then you verify the, the, um, the identity of the valve with the joint, right? So anyway, this is the first two steps, right? Any order you on the place. You ensure that the pipe supports are in place because you don't want to put no additional strain. You remove any packing material inside the valve, anything to stop it, right? And the grease, you clean that up. Right? And you install your valve in the designated location. You make sure it goes there because remember, you don't verify it on the joint. You verify the number, the identity. You make sure it goes in there. You check the orientation of the handle and all that. Right? You tell you a key thing you follow your manufacturer specification when you're mounting the actuator, how to lift the valve, how to bolt up the valve, and so on. Right? I give you an idea how you're mounting the gate valve, right? Most of the gate valve, you can mount any direction. But the light gate valve have a specific way you have to mount it because it have a flow indicator, it have a flow arrow on the body of the valve, right? Mention if you're running into any obstacles that you could rotate the valve or bolt hole to try to avoid a certain obstacle. You check the orientation of the valve handle, right? So, let me look at this valve. Say we watch our top view of the valve here, right? But if we put this handle straight across, if we let this handle come at a 90 degree, when people passing in the corridor, right, it can handbox them because it's long. So what we gonna do, we go tilt it one side. So you give them more room to pass. That's one reason you know, they are rotate them valve and them two, right? To give people passage to, to be easier to operate, and those are the reasons. They mention the butterfly, the ball, the plug valve, um, the installation of these valves. They tell you that the valve beyond is supposed to be normally vertical, but depending on if it has sediment passing through the line, right? They try to put the yand in a horizontal position. Right? Cloak valve, right? The mainly vertical, you can rotate it to avoid certain obstacles. Check valve, they give you a different type of check valve and they give you the application of the different check valve. Then they made the, they came to the diaphragm, which we close off on, and they made the comparison with that and the pinch valve. They give you the similarities of them and they give you some of the features that make the diaphragm. So they say the diaphragm can be changed without removing the valve from the line. That is a desirable thing. You don't have to unbolt the whole valve and cry it in the shop to make repair. All right. Um, we realize the valve passing. The only reason the valve will be passing is because the diaphragm is damaged. Right? So we'll change the diaphragm. We just unbolt the top work and change all the rubber. Bolt it back. Right? The bonnet, 
They mention the bonnet of the vase make it desirable. The liquid is not in contact with the bonnet or the valve at all. Right? Let me just, before I close, let me just roll back to yesterday and show you the diaphragm valve. Diaphragm valve. Right? Now, this is your bonnet or your diaphragm valve. If you look, the rubber providing a complete seal off from that bonnet area. So no liquid ain't coming in contact with that bonnet area. Because this rubber, the elastoma rubber, the diaphragm, is sealing it off. So anything go wrong, you just unbolt the stop work piping and you change the diaphragm if the valve passing. Most of the time, the, the, the diaphragm damage. Now with the wear type, the, the, the wear or the wall inside it, could be damaged to it, right? So when you remove the top piece, if you realize the wear was damaged, you know, you can either build it up depending on the material, if it's a weldable valve, you build it up with welding and you grind it back, and you install the top work with your diaphragm rod. Any questions before I close? Or oh, they leave the system. Any feedback? Any question? All there? Yeah. 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 All right. So I hope you recap the review, the um, little um, videos help you uh, help clarify any problems. All right. And we are getting to. Well, while you're doing the practical or some of the practical, I will be there for some of the days. So anything, um, just remind me, for those who don't fully understand the rotating of the bolt hole, just remind me to bolt up one on top flange and show you how easy it is to avoid um, to move the valve from a horizontal position to a 45 degree position or a 60 degree position by just rotating the bolt hole. Right, so I'll do that demonstration. Tomorrow, please go on. The session will be more or less a short session, right? And it's based on the troubleshooting of the valve, right? And we have the troubleshooting sheet and all those things. So we will go through a couple of, of the problems tomorrow, and you will see that the manufacturer um, plan ahead and know, hey, this might go wrong with the valve, so they have a sheet that in case that happens, do so and so to solve it. So we'll look at that tomorrow, please God. If no questions, people, have a safe night. Pardon. Be at home. Pardon. Yes. Right, Naomi. Yes. Right, oh, Naomi. Naomi. She will yes, announce the group, will announce tomorrow. The group right? tomorrow. All right. right. Okay. She'll announce it tomorrow, please yes. God. Huh? Tell you yes. to announce it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. So people, yeah. gentle people, yeah. everybody take care, stay inside. Remember, we still have the social distancing. If you're going out, wear your mask. And have a safe night. Read through your slides. Do your worksheet. And tomorrow, please go and we'll continue. Same time, 5 o'clock. So good night, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your life. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, man. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Uh, it's a Fraser. 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 Fraser, come on.